In 2020, Juventus had just won their ninth consecutive Serie A title and looked set to dominate Italian football for the next few years. Two seasons on, however, and they've only managed a couple of fourth place finishes, and they've let the Milan teams really take over in terms of the title race. The question is, what happened to Juventus? So let's just begin with a little bit of historical context. So on the board in front of me, we've just got a timeline here of Serie A season finishes for Juventus, going back all the way to 2007 and 2008. Now, the more discerning among you will know that the previous season, 06-07, was a season where Juventus were in Serie B, and that was because of the Calciopoli scandal. Now, the Calciopoli scandal was a refereeing scandal that happened in Serie A. There were five teams who were accused of being involved in this refereeing corruption, and Juventus, as punishment, was sent down to Serie B. Now, you could argue that the Calciopoli scandal actually benefited Juventus for two very specific reasons. The first one is that because they dropped down into the division below, they were able to slim down their squad, move some of the bigger contracts off their books, but they still kept enough of their big players to actually win the division comfortably. The other thing is that because of the Calciopoli scandal, some of the bigger players in world football wanted to dissociate themselves from Serie A, and so I think in 2006, 30 players actually ended up leaving the league to go elsewhere because they didn't want to be associated with a league that had the integrity of referees called into question. So that when Juventus arrived back in Serie A, they're still a strong team and they are entering a league that is actually significantly weakened. So you might think at that point that Juventus are destined to just simply rise to the top in Italian football. But as we can see from the timeline here, they do take a little bit of time getting there. So Claudio Ranieri, who you may know from his time at Leicester, is the first manager once they're back. He manages a third place finish, is sacked the next season, and then Juventus go through a series of smaller, lesser known managers who just are unable to really bring them to the, the, the very top of Italian football. 2010 is an important year for Juventus because that is the year when a businessman arrives at the club as the new chairman, that guy is Andrea Agnelli. And when he arrives, he makes a very important decision fairly early on in his tenure, which is to bring in a little known manager who's just got his team promoted from Serie B up into Serie A. And that man is Antonio Conte. Now we all know the name Antonio Conte now, the fans at Juventus knew him because he'd been a player there, but at the time, as a manager, he was not particularly well known. But this turns out to be a really good decision because as you can see, the three seasons where Conte is at Juventus, they win the league every season and they win a couple of Coppa Italianas as well along the way. Now there is a little bit of nervousness about European performances under Antonio Conte and this carries through into the tenure of the next manager that they pick up, Max Allegri. Now Max Allegri is brought in from AC Milan to replace Conte when Conte goes off to manage Italy and again there was a little bit of nervousness about him insofar as he just had a fairly poor season with Milan. They started off badly and they managed to climb their way back up to third but again it appears to be an inspired decision because as you can see those first place finishes continue. Five Scudetti in a row, there's also four four consecutive Coppa Italias and also a couple of Super Coppa Italianas thrown in along the way as well. So that brings us to the end of the 18-19 season, but there's still that worry about European competition. Max Allegri has carried Juventus to two Champions League finals, but they haven't won. And Andrea Agnelli is getting a little bit nervous about their performances in Europe. Now at this point, he makes two very important decisions about how Juventus can start winning the Champions League. The first one is a managerial decision. It's about play style. It's about how Juventus are set up. And the other one is buying Cristiano Ronaldo. So let's look at those two things consecutively. So in 2019, two men come to Andrea Agnelli with a proposition. Those two men are Fabio Paratici, who was the director of football, and Pavel Nedved, who is the vice chairman at the time. And the proposal is this. They've decided that the way that Juventus is structured is not gonna allow them to win the Champions League. What they need is to bring in different kinds of managers who will be able to achieve more in Europe. We've just seen Jurgen Klopp and Maurizio Pochettino battle it out over the Champions League final in that year. And the idea is that we need a system manager in order to get Juventus to the very top. And Andrea Agnelli agrees. So on the timeline here, you can see Maurizio Sarri is made the manager of Juventus. Now, Maurizio Sarri has had three good seasons at Napoli. He's just coming off the back of a season at Chelsea as well. But Maurizio Sarri is the definition of a system manager. So not only does he have very specific ideas about what his teams should do in possession, he also has very specific ideas about out of possession stuff. He likes his teams to press as a collective. So the idea is bring in Maurizio Sarri and we should be able to challenge in the Champions League. The problem is, is that the shift between Allegri and Sarri is not managed particularly well. 
There are some players who are brought in to fit the Sarri system, so Matej De Ligt is brought in from Ajax, but there are other players who seem to suit an Allegri system better, so players like Adrian Rabiot, Aaron Ramsey, and then that player that we mentioned before, Cristiano Ronaldo, none of whom really seem to suit a system-based style of play. The other thing is a pandemic strikes, and so all of these things come together to mean that actually Sarri's time at Juventus, despite the fact that he wins the Scudetto in 1920, it just doesn't particularly work very well. So at the end of that season, after getting knocked out in the round of 16 in the Champions League, one of the reasons he was brought in, it's goodbye to Sarri. Now the next manager that they bring in is even more progressive than the idea of bringing in Maurizio Sarri at Juventus because it's Andrea Pirlo who has only managed the under 23s at Juventus. He's got no senior experience. He is going to be assistant manager, but it's a massive gamble to bring him in at this point. And the same things happen that happened under Sarri. So you have problems with the squad. The squad isn't really suited to playing a system approach. And Andrea Pirlo's time is actually a little bit disappointing. It ends with a fourth place finish by the end of the season. But actually, if you look at some of the underlying numbers, you could argue that that fourth place finish was a little bit unlucky. So let's go and have a look at some of the data. So on the board in front of me now, I've just got an expected goals plot for so that's the blue line and against. So expected goals, expected goals against, and it's on a 10 game rolling average just to eliminate some of the noise. So the general idea is that when a team is putting up more expected goals for the blue line than expected goals against the red line, you're in a fairly healthy position. So we start with the 2017-18 season. So two seasons of Max Allegri. And as you can see here, things are not going particularly well for Juventus. So you can see the, the goals against going right up and the goals for dropping right down. The next season, there does seem to be an ironing out of some of the problems. So now the, the blue line is ahead of the red line, but there's a trend downwards. So whilst the defensive side of the game is getting better for Juventus, the attacking side of the game is getting a little bit worse. We then arrive at Maurizio Sarri, and as we can see, generally, this is fairly okay performance. He keeps tracking the, the blue line higher than the red line uh, across that time that he's there. And there's pretty much a correlation between those two lines. So not fantastic, but also not awful. When we get to Andrea Pirlo, as you can see, there is a trend line here, which is going up in terms of expected goals for. So Juventus are generating more and better chances under Andrea Pirlo. And as you can see, the expected goals against line is staying pretty level. So that means that the defensive side of the game stays the same, but actually in terms of the attacking side of the game, things are getting better. And then we get to Max Allegri's next season. They bring Max Allegri back in and as you can see, everything goes wrong. So let's take a look at the underlying numbers in a little bit more detail. So I've got the last three managers from Juventus here. So we've got Allegri's season in 18-19, then Sarri season, then Pirlo season, and then the return of Max Allegri in 21-22. And if you look at the face value numbers here, you can see there's a general trend downwards. So the position goes from first to fourth. You can see the points are going down every season. So it seems to make sense that actually what's happened when, since Allegri's gone is that things have gotten worse. But also if you look at the goals for and goals against, you can see that while the numbers are trending up in terms of goals for, they're also trending up a little bit in terms of goals against. So any improvement in terms of attacking play seems to be met with a regression in terms of defensive play. But let's take a look at the underlying numbers. So we've got expected goals for and expected goals against. And as you can see, the numbers for expected goals jump up massively after Allegri leaves. So Allegri's final season, 58.2 expected goals. Sarri jumps up by about 10 to 68.7. And then we get another jump to Pirlo the following season up to 74. So there's a marked increase in attacking quality under these next two managers. So the system manager thing seems to be working. But then if we look at the expected goals against, the jump up that we see in the actual column is much different to the expected column. So Max Allegri, 36.1, he only concedes 30 goals. So there's a difference of about six. He was conceding six fewer goals than you might have expected based on the chance quality. And as you can see, yes, there is a jump up to Sarri of about five, but there's only a jump of about two from Allegri to Pirlo. Now Pirlo's tracking his goals against pretty closely. So you could argue that Allegri has been a little bit lucky in this season. And again, if we look at the expected goals difference, so that's the difference between how much XG you're putting up against how much expected goals you're conceding, you can see that Max Allegri is the worst of these managers. So plus 22.1, 
versus plus 26 and plus 36. So it's clear that Andrea Pirlo is just putting up the best numbers in terms of expected goals. Now there's another metric that we can look at in order to see how unlucky Andrea Pirlo is and that's expected points. Now expected points are developed by using a model, taking all of the underlying data, so the expected goals for and expected goals against, simulating those games on the basis of that data and spitting out how many points you would expect a manager to get on that basis. So we've got here the expected points column for these four seasons. As you can see, Allegri 70.9 expected points, Sari 71.2 expected points, and then Pirlo 79.5 expected points. So Pirlo is putting up much higher expected points than his two predecessors. So if we actually compare the gap between the expected points and the actual points, we can then see how lucky Andrea Pirlo's predecessors really were. So if we go over to this column here, we've got the difference here between the expected points and the actual points. And you can see that Allegri is putting up about 20 points more than you might have expected on the basis of his underlying numbers. That's a massive overperformance. Sari again, 10 points over in terms of his performances. And then when we get to Pirlo, he's actually under the number that you'd expect for him to get in terms of the, the, the numbers that he's putting up. So in 2021, Andrea Pirlo is tracking his expected points pretty closely. But that season, Antonio Conte massively overperforms his expected points. Inter win Scudetto. Um, but actually, if you look at the expected points data for the league that season, Juventus, you would expect to have won that more often than not. So Andrea Pirlo has been pretty unlucky. So the irony of this period is that Juventus make some decisions that prove to be actually correct. They decide that they need to change their play style in order to be able to compete in Europe better. They actually do produce two managers who put up better numbers than Allegri has managed, but neither of them managed to succeed in Europe. And as a result of that, they panic after one season with a fourth place finish under Pirlo and they bring Max Allegri back. But we also need to talk about the second decision that Andrea Agnelli made in order for Juventus to win the Champions League, and that is signing Cristiano Ronaldo. Now, obviously on the field that didn't work. Juventus never won the Champions League with Ronaldo, but it also had a lot of impact off the field as well in terms of the wage structures of the club. So if we look at the board in front of me here, we've just got the wage bills for big clubs across European football in the 2021 season. As you can see, you've got all of the big players here, PSG, miles ahead of everyone else. Now, if we look at Juventus, Juventus are sort of bang in the middle of the teams that we've selected and would seem to be lower than some teams like Manchester United, Liverpool, Man City as well. But if we compare Juventus with their rivals in Serie A, we can actually see they're much further ahead. So here's Juventus, 323 million in terms of their wage bill. Um, drop down here to Inter, 262, so about 60 million gap between them. And then a massive drop down now to Milan with just 170 million. Now, remember Milan have just won the Scudetto last season, so a year on from this, they've got the much lower wage bill in, in that respect. And obviously bringing in Cristiano Ronaldo just bumps that up. So there's been two seasons of Cristiano Ronaldo at this point. So Ronaldo's data is included in this data set. Now, the problem that Juventus have in terms of their wage bill structure is that it's a very comfortable club to be if you're a Serie A player. If you're playing for the club, you're going to be on a fairly high wage. No one wants to move. And if you're in the situation that Juventus were in, which is they were bringing in new managers to develop system-based football, then it's very hard to actually monitor your squad, change things around and bring in the players that you want. And so actually by bringing in Cristiano Ronaldo, by pushing the wage structure up, by making the club a very comfortable place for people to be, Juventus actually shot themselves in the foot because they couldn't actually moderate their squad in such a way as to get the most out of their system-based managers. So what happened to Juventus? Well, Andrea Agnelli made two decisions which pushed the club in two different directions. On the one hand, he wanted them to improve their on-field performances, but off the field, they made certain decisions that made it impossible to actually achieve those goals. And so from going from Max Allegri to a more progressive approach, and then back to Max Allegri, ironically, Juventus have ended up in a worse position than they were in before. The two Milan teams are now vying for the title and Juventus seem a long way off from challenging. If you like this video, please consider subscribing to the channel. The Athletic brings you the best sports journalism in the world in a personalised experience, connecting you with the stories and teams that you care about the most. There's coverage of 13 sports, plus direct access to world-class journalists through live Q&As, discussions and podcasts. Not to mention, it's all ad-free. And you can try it now for free for 30 days by clicking the link in the description.